It has 4,000 members um, in 78 countries, and it is used to share all kinds of information. I actually got onto it, and they're sharing a lot of AT-related, ICT-related information, as well as you know, uploading your files and your music and your books. So, okay, so, so what? All of this? I know I have how many minutes? Um, so, a conversation we've been having is that this it doesn't really make sense to develop this one model because obviously one model isn't going to work for everything, and all these solutions are valid. Um, they're really depends on the needs, it depends on the region, it depends on the political environment, what's going to be effective. Um, there's many more effective models out there. We don't know how to find them except for a <laughs> conversation and who you know. Um, so it would be good to, to start putting that together of um, groups that have been successful in solving these problems and in a, in a sustainable way. Um, and then there's obviously probably many more ineffective, unsustainable models, um, and we've talked about that, the dependency on NGOs. Um, and there's other examples like the AT that's been distributed and people just sell off the parts because they actually can use it for something else or it, it has a greater value elsewhere or when there's no training or maintenance involved. Um, this was something that came up last year, is there a market? Because some people say there's the, the reason there hasn't been a big investment in low-cost AT is because there's no market for it. And so it's always considered charity, philanthropy. Um, but there's a number of people that are arguing that's actually not true. That there's a fairly large market for low-cost AT and we're just not devoting the resources to developing that because we're focusing a lot of our resources in very sophisticated, high-cost AT that's only going to be accessible for people that are within environments that are very well supported institutionally by insurance or government programs um, or if they have their own private resources. So, um, and I think we've seen by these examples of the, the social entrepreneur models is that they are, there's definitely a possibility to be more self-sustaining. Um, so who's purchasing it? The market, we have obviously NGOs, governments, the DPOs, and um, persons with disability. And then who's funding this? Um, I was actually curious, Ray, who does fund the, your organization? Is it mostly private donors? Um, initially it was USAID. Okay. Um, and then as time went on, private. Okay. So started with USAID, and, which is probably the largest international donor here, and then private funding. Um, and then we have, investors um, and USA government grants. Uh, if we think about this in terms of points of access, um, we have online, obviously, and we're going to be talking about that. Um, Cliff is going to, we're going to move more into the information technology side. Um, hospital schools, disability persons organizations, NGOs, we have the local hardware store, and rehabilitation centers, which is a whole day talk in of itself. Um, but there was an example I just read of research done in Ghana, and there was one rehab center in the entire country, and the, you know, the number of rehab specialists you can count on one hand. Um, so I think we have to be realistic too that if we have the best technology, low-cost technology we develop, if we're not thinking about the on-the-ground infrastructure, um, there's, yeah, there's going to be another barrier. Um, I think I talked about that. Oh, I guess I want to talk about a little bit. Um, another conversation I've been having is that we really need to think about the hard to reach people. And there's a number, I mean, I'd say most people we've talked about that they're not inside the information system. Um, they're not even connected to DPOs, disability persons organizations, which there are, you know, hundreds of thousands around the world, but they still are people that are already participating in some way. Um, and so there's, there's a, a big need to think through that issue of really reaching the unreachable. Um, and I think there's more creative, innovative ways to do that now with um, cell phone technology, for one, 
there's some other avenues or, or there's models out there in public health that are building those bridges between those regional centers and people in more rural uh, areas. So those are a number of examples of things I've been hearing. Any questions and then we're going to have lunch. I don't actually have a question as much as I'm just so interested in this reaching the hard to reach part. We had um, um, interviews and focus groups with people we were working with, and there's this one village that's in the Andes, it's tucked away, pretty far away, and so they only get the services that end up coming to them on a kind of scheduled basis, and then you have to come to the community center if you're going to participate. And we asked the people there who are more involved in the community, well, how do we reach other people? Because the same people were coming again and again, and she literally walks up the mountainside because there's not many roads up there, so she'll walk to somebody's door and let them know that somebody's coming. And we promote sort of the, you know, uh, consumer-centered model where the person themselves has their, you know, uh, um, makes their decisions and all that, but they want us to bring white coats and be a clinic because that will get the people off of the mountain if we do that. So people have ideas for this, and so I'm really interested. We've uh, raised some really uh, important basic issues here. Um, my, my experience in just working in Vietnam, um, there's a lot of money in Vietnam. Um, there's a lot of people that can afford to buy their disability devices, um, and um, but there's also a lot of NGOs still in Vietnam giving things away for free, and um, a large uh, you know this we certainly respect the uh, the individuals that don't have income that can't afford these devices, but we have become um, as we started to hand our program back to the Vietnamese. We actually do um, kind of a, a visual means test now. Because when someone, um, uh, like an amputee, drives up on a $4,000 motorcycle and asks for a free $100 leg, um, we have a big problem with that. And I think this is um, kind of the tip of the iceberg of this whole issue um, in, in many countries that are receiving huge investments um, from the large NGOs and we as a small organization have had a real issue with this and, and when is it time for the big dollars to leave and for the private the small entrepreneurs and the government um, to start picking up because they won't do it if the big money's still there and that's um, I really think this is a kind of a key issue in, in exciting the, the small private sectors because that um, I can be very honest with you the um, the best prosthetists in Vietnam are very small family owned shops not the large rehab centers owned by NGOs and so and they charge for the services they're very reasonable fees they provide excellent service they don't do anything for free so I think it's a good conversation. Anything else? You guys hungry? <laughs> okay, let's break for lunch. Um, I actually think we have about 45 minutes.